This is a very brief introduction to axonometric drawings and it's going to give you an oversight of um, how the drawings are constructed, a reminder of the principles involved, what's important about axonometric drawings and some examples that demonstrate that this is both a technique for drawing, a kind of tool for drawing, but also is um, a form of representation in its own right that has been used by particular architects in the past in order to be able to uh, elucidate upon or demonstrate ideas about their own architecture. Okay, so Qing is a very useful place to start in terms of understanding the principles um, of axonometric drawings. Now, uh, he uses an American term called paraline drawings um, and breaks them down into three different forms. One is called the plan oblique, which is what we would normally call the axonometric. We have the isometric we also have um, elevation obliques, which are fairly unusual drawings. Do find them occasionally in architecture, but not very often. On the left, you see the plan oblique, um, which is uh, what we would call the axonometric. The plan is preserved at the base. Um, in order to get the modelling of more than one facade, the plan is rotated around, and it can be rotated to a varying degree, and the what would be the vertical surfaces of a building are then projected up vertically from that we can see that the elevation as a result is distorted. So page 89 of Qing, which you can get online or you can go into the library and get a paper copy, explains how you might go about constructing a, a plan oblique or an, isomet or an axonometric drawing. So you begin with a plan, you rotate it round to the desired angle, you need to think about which angle might be appropriate depending on the emphasis you want to give to the two facades that are going to be displayed in the drawing. So explanation there clearly about how you might do that. Don't forget that if you're using tracing paper, you simply slide the plan of the drawing underneath a um, fresh layer of tracing paper and you rotate it. And you can, of course, do the same thing in a drafting CAD program like Vectorworks. There are also some useful tips about how you might think about going about constructing complex forms. For example, that you might think about creating a volume first, an overall volume, and then subtracting other volumes from it by measuring down or measuring into the drawing. Um, a second approach might be to compose the drawing out of a series of blocks um, constructed separately and if you're dealing with curves or circles that appear in elevation in the design then you need to be able to um, break that down into a series of segments if you like and measure each one up. Again, there's more advice in Qing about how to do this. There's lots of advice here about how to use different line weights to emphasize the modeling of the form and um, about how you might use expanded views or exploded views in order to be able to explain different kinds of construction. And also how you might use cutaways to be able to explain um, an architectural idea or an architectural principle that you have at work. What's important to remember is that the drawings that uh, Ching uses are uh, clear, straightforward, but quite basic. So now I'm going to show you some examples of work that hopefully will be a little bit more inspirational for you once you've got a hang of the principles involved. Okay, so here's an example um, by Le Corbusier. It was uh, for a design for a house that was subsequently built. Um, the Villa Stein um, and we can see the way in which the drawing has been used to emphasize the cubic or the, the volumetric nature of the design with its very strong front facade on the lower part of the, um, of the building design and the rear garden facades being actually a series of open terraces. So the drawing is able to celebrate um, the nature of the design, having these two very different kinds of facades and yet giving the impression, at least from the front, of this rather solid, massive block of, um, in this case, uh, white uh, rendered surface. Um, you'll notice when you look at the roof, um, uh, the roof plan that the circular forms still remain circular. Um, and that's because of the way in which the uh, plan is preserved in the elevation, whereas the side elevation windows become almost diamond shaped. This is um, another example um, from a uh, similar period, the Villa Schroeder by Rietveld. Um, and here it is uh, used to explore the um, planar nature of the de Stiel interior. So this is a kind of exploded 
and dematerialized, if you like, view of the interior um, of the upper floor of this house. Um, you can just see the lower floor um, below, but it's rather obscured. Um, and so we have here the, um, the four rooms that compose the interior, which are divided in this case by sliding screens. And uh, Rietveld has used uh, translucent paint in order to represent not only the internal screens, but also elements of the facade. You'll see at the bottom the white panel there is actually a, um, a panel of plaster, so you wouldn't normally be able to see through it. So um, he's also emphasised the elements of the interior that would be coloured. So what we get is we get a plane which is indicated with sort of a close pencil texture that runs along beneath all of these elements, um, uniting them, and then almost floating above them we have the volumes of the interior, the fireplace, the, the piano, the table, the bed and so on, and the chairs. Here we have um, a very, very different use of the axonometric, this time from a later period from the 1960s um, by an architect called James Sterling. It is a college, an Oxford college, so it would have um, student housing and common rooms and teaching rooms. See photographs of the built work on the right hand side <clears throat> and on the left we have the drawing. Now interestingly, um, this is not a, uh, an axonometric looking down from above onto the plan. This is a kind of an axonometric that's been flipped to give the worm's eye view um, from below looking upwards. This has the effect of removing, if you like, the relationship between the building and the ground and emphasising the um, object-like nature of the building sitting against the sky. And we can see that in the built work, that's part of the experience of the architecture itself. So the drawing explores that. It also explores the object-like nature of the drawing. And this is a reference back to the origin of the axonometric drawing as a way of being able to describe engineering components um, uh, during the late 19th century. So it's a drawing technique that derives from um, engineering, from, uh, from the, the depiction or the representation of technologies. And you can see here that it's being used to describe a building which almost has that sense of being, if you like, formed out of a kind of a process of bringing together a series of components. It's a pencil drawing uh, with also with, with pen, so pen line and uh, pencil um, rendering and texturing. Here is another drawing by James Sterling, uh, this time uh, again for another university. I think this is uh, for either for Sterling University or it actually might be for IBM. And this actually this drawing, there's a copy of this drawing in the RIBA uh, drawings collection at the VNA in the in the drawings room at the VNA. And here, interestingly, we can see the way in which the cutaway has been used to almost emphasise the envelope nature of the uh, blue and green cladding. It's pulled away, almost like a kind of packet of biscuits has had its part of the, the, the end of it removed, revealing the um, floor structure within. Of course, this is a, a trick of the drawing, and you'd never actually be able to build it in this way, but it's a way of representing the architecture, how the architectural idea is conceived, as opposed to how it might actually be built. Here we have um, some drawings, uh, some sketch drawings on the left and a final drawing on the right, again a worm's eye view. But we can see here that uh, these sketches by James Sterling, he uses the axonometric as part of his, um, as part of his design process. It's a, it's a very easy drawing to create when you're sketching and it's a very quick way of understanding what volumetrically um, might, uh, you, might, you might experience in a, in a, in a space. Here we have um, a, a very different kind of example of the use of the axonometric, this time for the Naga King capsule apartments in Japan. So it's a, um, a drawing of the interior, of the fit out of the interior of one of these capsules designed for businessmen to sleep overnight, a kind of one room hotel uh, with everything supplied, including a little bathroom, um, work desk, and this window with a um, fan shaped spiral blind. Um, the drawing has a kind of cutaway of two sides um, and then other elements are shown almost like in a kind of ghost-like appearance to allow us to be able to see through the drawing. And another example here at a much larger scale um, for a library in Germany which was subsequently built. And here interestingly we have two axometric drawings at the top middle which have been brought together. 
um, mainly in order to be able to describe the nature of the walkway that you would take between the two buildings, which is actually part of a, a route through the city. So two axometric drawings laid separately and then brought together in this kind of composite affair.